are listening to Through the Bible with David Melda, where we are teaching the foundational truths for discipleship. We hope you will be encouraged and blessed by this teaching today. And Melda and I believe if a person will change the way they think, they will change the way they live. Amen, David. Amen. And Heavenly Father, give us the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom as we read and teach your word today. Thank you for revealing your will to us and helping us to know more about you today than we did yesterday. These things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen, David. Melda, thank you so much for that prayer. And you know, last week we finished up lesson eight of Spirit, Soul, and Body. It was called Sealed. And the primary scripture that we use there was Ephesians 1.13 that says that we are sealed with the spirit of promise. You know, when we get born again, um, it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says because we become a new creation in Christ. That's happened in our spirit. It says that we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And understanding that we're created a spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, it says where Paul's praying for the, the, the church and for us as individuals, it says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So when people get a revelation about spirit, soul, and body and understanding the only thing that got born again is your spirit, your soul did not get born again, your body did not get born again, therefore it's up to you and I to align our mind, will, and emotions, our personality, our intellect to the Spirit of God and the Word of God uh, as we read it. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to know what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So as we go about our daily activities, we are to have enough of God's Word in us to uh, allow us to be obedient to the Spirit of God that, mm -hmm. that's living in us. It's, our body is called the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so if God lives in you and Jesus is truly your Lord, then Jesus being Lord and Master over your life means He is in control. You know, people say, well, God is in control of everything. Well, let me ask you this. Is He in control of you today? Because that's the best control you can have. Me, myself, and I will mess my plans up, but God developing our plans will absolutely create the best made plans for us. So, Melda, we're going to get into Lesson 9 of Spirit, Soul, and Body. This is called Eternal Redemption. <clears throat> And I like to remind people that the redemption that Jesus paid for uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection is eternal. All we have to do is believe it and receive it by faith. And so when, uh, when we make that confession of faith of Jesus being our Lord, that is the beginning of something wonderful, our Amen. eternal redemption. Amen. So we're going to get into this lesson and pray it's a blessing to you. We're going to talk a little bit. We're going to be in Hebrews today, David. And we're going to talk about the contrast on the Old Testament law and the New Testament grace. What we've received through Jesus in the New Covenant, praise God, is far superior than the Old Testament sacrifices. You know, we might say to Melda, we might let our listening audience know that there are really seven major covenants in the Scripture. And I'm going to list them real quick, like, but you can go through and check it out. You have the Adamic Covenant that God made with Adam. You have the Noahic covenant that God made with Noah. You have the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham. You have the Mosaic covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel. Remember the 613 commandments with the big 10 there. Then you had the land covenant in which God made with the children of Israel, promising them the borders of the land in which they will inhabit. Then you had the Davidic covenant a covenant that he made with David, a promise that he made with David that uh, he would um, uh, have a, a lineage of the throne of God. And then, of course, the new covenant. This is the covenant that Jeremiah spoke about in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, about a new covenant. And this is a covenant that Jesus came to give us, the new covenant or the New Testament. So understand there's seven <clears throat> major covenants in Scripture and the one that we have, as you're going to find out, is called the better covenant or the best covenant. Amen. 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 And David, we know that uh, before the Jesus came, before he came, that uh, sacrifices had to be offered over and over and over again 
to purge their sins. That's right. But now that Jesus has given his life as a sacrifice for sin, it never again needs to be repeated. I love that. When we are when we accept Christ as our Savior, it's eternal. That's exactly right. And through Christ, the perfect sacrifice for all sin has been made once and for all. That's right. And that word, all. Yeah. All. Your born-again spirit never needs to be re-cleansed, re-purged, or born again. Yeah, and you know, when Nicodemus was asking Jesus these questions in John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then later on in that same chapter, he said, unless a man be born again, he cannot have eternal life or everlasting life. And you know, the thing that we have to understand is once Jesus cleans you up, once he cleans us up by his blood, it says his blood washes away all of our sins, all of our iniquities. And once he cleans us up, now he has a place to move up inside of us and live and inhabit in our born again, regenerated spirit. You know, in Hebrews 9, 11 through 12, it says, but Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Understand that when Jesus uh, was talking to the Pharisees, he was letting them know that the, the temple of God or the tabernacle of God was going to absolutely be destroyed. And in 70 AD, it was destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. But Jesus said, if you, if you tear this um, tabernacle down, I will build it up in three days. Well, he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection, three days of, of uh, being in the grave and then being resurrected. He built it back up, and he's not, he wasn't talking about a physical building. He was talking about a body by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. That He is our tabernacle, and we are the tabernacle of God. When you get born again, you have God living inside of you. Well, let's just remember our salvation is eternal forever. That's right. And David, that talks about it in Hebrews 9, 13. Yeah, through 13 15. through 15. It says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, sprinkled on the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to purge uh, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause, he is a mediator of a new covenant. We mentioned the new covenant, the new the new covenant, the new testament, that by <clears throat> means of death for the redemption of transgressions that we were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So right there, we, we come from <clears throat> uh, the first testament, which uh, you know was legalistic in its way, religious legalistic ways. And now we have been set free from the legalistic systems of the law. And now where we live by the spirit of God that dwells in us. So we could really say it like this. Jesus entered in once into the holy place. That's right. And obtained eternal redemption for us all. That's right. Then in verse 15, he provided an eternal inheritance. Each of these statements emphasize a one-time sacrifice that works for all. And you know here, too, David, we could say it like this. He died his blood for believers and unbelievers. He died for the whole world. So if you're an unbeliever today, he has made the sacrifice for you. That's right. All you have to do is accept him as your Lord. And That's right. God really wants us to drive this point home that he died for you and us. Now we're going to go over to Hebrews 9, 24 through 28. Yeah, it says, For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which is the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he offer 
have offered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this a judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And boy, that is the too good to be true that good is. news. Amen, amen. And you know, David, many times, we don't talk about it a lot, but when they would bring the sacrifices for their sins and they would come uh, to the temple, what they were looking for is that the animal was perfect to give it to God because they were not perfect. That's right. So they could not be forgiven at that point. They were just making bringing an animal for the sacrifice, and they would go from one time to the next if they would come back. Old Testament sacrifices were offered constantly, but Jesus entered into the holy place and made one sacrifice. Since we die once, <clears throat> and that's when we accept Christ, he suffered once, and that one sacrifice paid for sin forever. Old Testament sacrifices could not do what the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did. They were only temporary shadows of the real thing to come. That's right. And you know, Melda, it was required uh, by Levitical law that all males, all Jewish males, would bring their sacrifice three times a year at three different feasts. Um, these three feasts, uh, the first one was Passover. The second one was the Feast of Weeks, and the last one was the Feast of Booths or Tabernacle. So all males had to come to Jerusalem with their sacrifices, and they had to do that three times a year. Uh, also, uh, the priest would go in once a year uh, into the Day of Atonement, and he would offer a sacrifice <coughs> once a year. So there was a lot of bloodshed taking place uh, within the law and, and because of the sins of so many people. But think about this. Why did they keep doing it over and over and over again? And the scriptures tell us is because it did not eliminate the sins. It only covered them for a time. And Jesus eliminated the penalty of Amen. sin Amen. because of his blood. <clears throat> and that's why it's called the too, the, the too good to be true good news because Jesus went once eliminated all sin for the entire world, for those who believe. If you don't believe, then your sins are still uh, accounted to you on the day of judgment. But understand that there was a lot of work involved with having your sins forgiven as a Jewish male, especially back in the day, because you were required to go. And if you didn't go, uh, you know what? You were living in your sins, and which could be detrimental. Consequences of that are terrible. So... I want to I want to continue uh, with this uh, lesson in reading Hebrews 10, 1 through 2. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. See, these, these offerings of, uh, of sacrifice and all these things that the children of Israel was going through, it brought their sin consciousness back up to them year after year. And every time they offered uh, what they did, they come to uh, have their sins covered. Now, just, just a little teaching on uh, Jewish uh, culture and, and what happens uh, when they would bring a sacrifice. I want you to imagine you yourself maybe bringing a lamb uh, to the temple and you walk up to the priest with your lamb and what the priest looks at is the perfection of your sacrifice. He's really not interested in your sins because number one, he knows that you sinned, okay? But he's interested in the perfection of your sacrifice. It says that they were to bring a, a lamb without spot, without blemish, perfect. Well, that's what Jesus was. He was a lamb, the lamb of God, without blemish, without spot, without sin, because Amen. that's the only way he could offer himself is because he was without sin. This little lamb was without sin because he was just a little lamb. So when it looked right, 
the, the priest would say, okay, let's offer him for a sacrifice. He'd cut his throat, bleed him out, and he would sprinkle the blood upon the, the, uh, the, t- the altar and also upon the person. And their sins were covered, not forgiven, but they were, for co- they were covered at that time. But it, they had to do it year after year, three times a year, and that kept them mm-hmm. in the conscience of sin. So, David, the New Testament believers, if we really believe the truth of God's Word, you can literally reach a place where you are no longer sin conscious. Amen. You would recognize that your spirit had been sanctified. And what does the word sanctified mean? To be set Set apart apart and and holy. That's right. And perfected forever. God doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees your born-again spirit and believe it or not, brother and sister, he is pleased. Amen. If you focus your thoughts <clears throat> on who you are in the spirit, you'll be conscious of righteousness. That's right. And you know, I tell people this. I've, I've heard people say, and I said it myself before I knew better. And you know, the thing that I realized one day is I was just talking about, woe is me. I'm just an old lowly sinner just trodden through. And, and you know, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, look, why are you calling me a sinner? I said, Lord, I didn't call you a sinner. I called me a sinner. He says, whatever you call you is what you call me. He said, because I live in you. And he said, sinners are someone that lives by definition in a perpetual sinful life. He said, are you living in a perpetual sinful life, David? I said, no, sir, I'm not. He said, then you're not a sinner. You're my son. And sometimes sons disobey. Sometimes sons fall down and I pick them up and I dust them off. But people that call themselves a sinner, they think they're being humble and all this kind of stuff when in fact you need to be calling yourself a son because I can challenge you, nowhere in Scripture will you find that we are called sinners of God. We're called the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. So therefore, David, we need to approach God through Jesus and what He did in our born-again spirit, saying, Father, thank You that through Christ, I have boldness to enter right into your very throne of grace. That's right. Because Jesus made us righteous. Amen. If you honestly think, oh God, I'm so unrighteousness, then you either need to be born again or you need to renew your mind and start believing the truth of God's word. Amen. You, and let's remember this, we have been made the righteousness, righteousness, of God in Christ. And I have a scripture for that, David. That's, And this is, I love this. It's Romans 12, 2. Mm-hmm. And it says, um, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, Amen. that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. It's just telling us right there, what we need to believe is by renewing our mind That's to right. what God's Word says. That's right. Because the Spirit of God dwelling in us is already dwelling in us in absolute perfection. And it's all up to you and I, brothers and sisters, to read God's Word to where we have a standard. We have a format by which we live that we live according to the Word of the Lord. And get a grip of this. You've been forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future. That's what eternal redemption, I love this, means. You might think, God can't forgive me of a sin I've just committed. Well, you better pray that he can, because Christ only died once for our sins. If Jesus can't forgive a sin before you commit it, then you can't be forgiven at all. And why is that? Jesus Christ hasn't died for sin in over 2,000 years ago. That's right. Jesus paid for all sins, and I'm going to say it again, past, present, and future. We may think this way, but God doesn't. He's eternal. Time, distance, and space aren't a problem for him. Through his perfect sacrifice, God has already dealt with all sins. That's right. Well, it says that in Hebrews 10.10. It says, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So what he did was absolutely once and for all, and he offered himself once for all sins. So, you know, people say, want to say that, well, I I just can't believe it. Jesus died for all of my future sins. Well, think about this. 
if he can't die for all your future sins, uh, 2,000 years ago when he died, they were all future. And so he took care of all sins, whether they be past, present, or future. Think about this. When he, when he died, there were saints resurrected by his, through his resurrection because of the forgiveness of sins by their faith in believing in God. So he was forgiven past, present, and future sins, and so are you. Amen, amen. And David, we can also call the Word of God his last will and testament. And you know, David, some religions have came up with the doctrine of backsliding, that every time you sin, you lose your salvation. And if you don't confess it before you die, you'll go to hell, despite the fact that you've been born again for 20 or 30 years. They erroneously interpret this verse to mean one sacrifice for all people. And that's really sad, David. I've heard that so many times. And I've had family to believe that way. Well, you know, and you and you have people that live that way, and they have a huge fear that maybe they didn't confess all their sins. You know, this is the thing. When you get born again, your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. Past, Past present, present, and future. future. And they have been forgiven. And people say, well, doesn't it say I have to confess my sins before he forgives them? Let me ask you this. Do you think God didn't know that you were going to commit that sin? Do you think it took God by surprise and say, oh, that's one that I didn't see coming, and yeah, you better confess it because I didn't see coming? No. He knew every sin that you and I would ever commit from the time we were born to the time we take our last breath, and he has forgiven us of all sins. Now, does that mean that because I'm forgiven of all sins, I can go out and live however I want? No. I mean, anyone that says, I'm going to get born again and live how I want, you, you're probably not born again. You, we are here now as born again believers, and we are to hate sin. We are to despise sin, to hate where we come from, that we never go back again. Some people do. It says it's like a dog returning back to his vomit or a pig returning back to her walla. This is the thing. When you get born again and truly fall in love with Jesus, you never want to go back to where you come from. You want to live a righteous and holy life because of the righteousness and holiness that lives in you. You have the root of righteousness inside of you. And because of that, you are a new creation in Christ. And now you want to live holy and righteous and perfect in this present world. And you know what? When we mess up, God has already forgiven us, and we keep moving forward we, yes. in true holiness. Amen. Amen. And David, Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. Yeah, it says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever, listen, perfected for, forever. forever them that are sanctified. If you have been born again, you're sanctified, set apart, you're holy, and he has perfected you forever in your born again spirit. Now, it's all about bringing that perfection out of our born again spirit into our mind, will, and emotions, our personality and intellect to where now we begin to live the life of Christ living through us and in us. Well, David... If you're not convinced by now, we have another verse, and that is Hebrews 12, 23. Yeah, it says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hallelujah. Do you know that when you get born again, our spirit becomes perfect, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. The Holy Ghost is perfect. And when you have perfection living inside of you, you now have, have that perfection and that holiness and that righteousness. You have been justified that now you can begin to live a life of perfection and holiness in your life. Does, do we get it right 100% of the time? No, none of us do. But what is your heart's desire? David was considered a man after God's own heart. And here he is, a king that committed adultery, committed murder, but you know what? He repented. He come back to God and his heart's desire was to be just like God and God accounted it to righteousness unto him even though he committed murder and adultery. Listen, the, don't think that you have done so bad for so long in your life that you cannot be forgiven. If you're out there thinking, well, I need to straighten up before I can come to God. No, you come to God and God will straighten you up. There's nobody too dirty 
too imperfect, too low, that God will not lift you up and pick you up and make you a son or daughter of the Most High God today. How clear can it get, David? Your spirit has been perfected forever, for all time. You don't lose your right standing with God if you sin. What a radical, wonderful truth for you and I today. Most Christians are taught that their performance affects your relationship with God. When you are born again, you're forgiven, cleansed. You become a brand new person. And let's just go ahead and say this. There's a difference between your relationship and your fellowship. Your relationship is blood bought by the blood of Jesus. Just like you could never become unblood related to your mother or father. You are related to your mother and father forever because of the blood. We are related to God forever because of the blood, but your fellowship can be broken uh, by our activity of sinful living. This is when we feel like God has left us or God has, has moved away from us because of sin. Well, God has gone nowhere. God still lives inside of you. But I want to be clear. I do not believe in what is called once saved, always saved uh, doctrine. I believe that your confession absolutely brings you into salvation of God. And I believe that your confession as a mature Christian, this is a whole nother teaching. I believe your confession by saying, I don't believe it anymore can also uh, remove yourself from the eternal redemption that you have had promised to you by God. So that's a whole nother teaching, but I want you to understand that when you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you believe in Him as your Lord and Savior, you desire to live for Him, you hate sin, and you love righteousness, you are a child of God and you remain that way through the power and strength of God. I want to close this teaching uh, with a scripture out of 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, the uh, disobedient, for the ungodly, and sinners, for the unholy, and profane. You see, the law is made to bring people to Christ, and that is perfectly what it does, is you cannot keep it without Him. And our encouragement for the brethren today is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 1 John 4.4, 4, we are of God's children, greater is He that is in you than he that is in this world. And encouragement for the lost is Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you have heard the scripture today and you confess with your mouth out loud, to God. I believe Jesus died for all my sins, and I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus, I am asking you to come live in my heart and be the Lord of my life forever. Friends, you have just been born again and will live forever with our Lord Jesus and our Heavenly Father in heaven forever. Please join yourself to a good Bible-believing group of Christians and become a disciple. Thank you, Melda. And you know, for more information about us or how to sponsor this program, please visit our website at onlybelievegod.com. You can connect with us on Facebook to know our Bible study times and locations. You may call 409-383-4466 or 409-383-3823. And Melda and I are always available for mission trips and speaking engagements as we promote the kingdom of God. Please contact us for scheduling. And again, we want to thank you for listening to Through the Bible with David and Melda. Where, where the, the truth, truth you know will set you free. I live by the Spirit of God within. I live by the Spirit of God.